is not just about being able to do more and get to appointments on schedule, it's about life management. Whatever we do in life requires time. It seems like a pretty simple equation, yet we'd probably all agree that we can always find room for improvement in the way we effectively handle our time. I mean, how many of you get to the end of the day and you think, oh, I wish I'd done that differently? Or you even get to lunchtime and you think, where's that morning gone? Wish I could have done that better. So the differentiator, of course, is how we each utilize our time. If we're clear about our purpose and priorities, we focus our energy on those things that move us toward fulfilling our purpose. If we're not clear on our purpose and priorities, then we're subject to being swayed by the winds of influence. Our spouses, our children, even our managers at work, peers, obviously social media, TV, etc. So today we've got, uh, I'm glad to have three uh, lovely speakers for you to listen to, and they're going to share their ideas of purposeful time as they see it. So first we have uh, Leslie, Leslie Preston. So originally from New York, does that mean you get to vote today? <laughs> yes. Blue? <laughs> um, and she, uh, Leslie founded Batch Gear Holiday Homes in 2003. Now Batch Gear has grown to become the leading full service holiday home rental management company in New Zealand and the largest in Australasia and was named one of the world's top 20 vacation rental companies in 2019. In early 2019, Batch Gear was successfully sold to UK private equity backed Sykes Holiday Cottages. Having completed the handover, she stepped down as CEO at the end of last year. Previously, Leslie had a successful corporate career, including KPMG Pete Marwick and Bankers Trust in New York City, Austin Consulting Group, and Val South Vodafone in New Zealand. Senior management roles, included GM of Marketing, GM of Customer Operations, GM of Corporate Development, and Head of Strategy. Her education background includes an MBA from Stanford University, Graduate School of Business, and a BA from Franklin and Marshall College. Now Leslie thrives and adds the most value when she is involved in companies that are guided by clarity of purpose and values. Operate with an ethos of getting shit done. Their words, I take it, not mine. Um, and strive to continuous, continuously make a difference. So with that, I'd like to put you in the warm hands of uh, Leslie. Hello. Uh, a little bit, a little bit nervous. Haven't had much chance in the last 15 years to uh, be speaking much as I've been focusing on family and the business. Um, today I'm just going to talk a little bit about leading a purposeful, a purpose-driven life. Um, as uh, Richard said, uh, Steph and I met at Stanford Business School and I was class secretary and it was a, a role that I didn't know kept going long after I had graduated but I had the privilege of understanding what everyone was doing around the world from our class. It was about 10 years after graduation and a, someone that was in investment banking in New York made the comment that he um, forgot to smell the roses. Uh, he was very successful, single guy, not married, and all he did was focus on life. So kind of stuck on this notion of don't forget to smell the roses. Um, this is a picture of the beach house we bought right after the first lockdown. And I think it's part of our uh, change in the phases of our life to be much more purposeful in enjoying the time. I think New Zealand, we're lucky that we have more flexibility to, to create a purpose-driven life than what I'm used to. Can you hear me? Uh, it's not working. No, uh, I think in New Zealand, we're very lucky that we can create a more flexible lifestyle compared to um, certainly what I'm used to in the States and I think many other countries around the world. Uh, another part about this problem driven life <laughs> is a definition that one of our professors talked to us about on uh, being wealthy versus rich. And being rich is having the money and being wealthy is having the money and time. So a lot about what life is about is making sure that we have the wealth, whatever that uh, may be. 
you will have seen on the uh, invitation that both myself and Stefan are speaking. Stefan, obviously, is my husband. We met at Stanford Business School. The graph on the right indicates why we're not having an interactive presentation and we're each giving our presentations on our own. Uh, those of us that know us know we're completely different. Um, and I guess they say magnets attract. Uh, we're the, the yin and the yang. Um, we have a complementary skill set. We come at things from completely different ways and we get to a better answer by collaborating, by bickering. Um, it's a little bit like cats and dogs and brother and sister. But um, I think the graph on the right is quite interesting. If you look at the dimension of boundaries and involvement, if you think about purposeful, purposeful time, um, you can have loosely defined boundaries or quite tightly defined boundaries. And then on the vertical axis is involvement. So you're hands-on or hands-off. I'm very much a hands-on, uh, no boundaries. And Stefan is very much uh, boundaries and hands-off. So my life and business and kids have all interwoven into a nice, a nice journey. Um, lives are intertwined, whether we like it or not, and there's more power when you think purposely about all those intersections, whether it be you and your relationships, family, business, employment, your staff, key partners. Um, I think it's choose wisely, because you just, you want to be uh, quite intentional about it. Uh, another quote from business school is, um, you always want to make sure you create enough wealth so that if your values get compromised and your purpose is compromised, you can get fucked. Uh, and that was, <laughs> and it, it stood for a long time, and when I left the corporate world, it was one of those get fucked moments where my values were compromised and it was time to be on my own. And I've been self-employed for about uh, over 20 years. Uh, if you think about uh, Steph and I as a couple, we were very purposeful about different phases of our life and our marriage, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. But we went as far as having five-year plans, and what is it that we were trying to achieve in each of these time periods? We did a little graph when we first got married of at what point, where did we want to be mortgage-wise before we started having a family? And I think that purposeful planning gave us a lot more flexibility later on in life to do what it is that we wanted. And um, also we, I guess, bounced off with each other on who was having predictable cash flow and a steady job and who was going out and trying the entrepreneurial. And we, we went back and forth. I stayed in corporate stuff on my own was, um, that didn't work so well, we'll talk about. Uh, and then I, I tried and he went back to corporate and then we, we flipped and flopped along the way. Uh, intertwined, I see batch care like a third child as well. And life became intertwined. The kids became part of batch care, and batch care became part of our life. And I think that's what has made uh, our life successful as a family, and that we're able to balance all of those together. Uh, Stefan also, in this intertwined, gave me the, the space and the financial flexibility that I could go off and pursue this crazy dream with batch care that I had uh, to make it possible. Um, I think even when you talk about partners, Gilligan Shepherd, I remember Bruce looking at me in the early days of batch care, having come off a great corporate salary, saying, what are you doing? Are you sure you know what it is that you're doing? And we'll talk a little bit more about batch care. So the different phases, we see it as pre-kids, kids, and empty nesters, as very defined stages of life. And we are actively in the empty nester stage, and I've really thought about the transition between kids and empty nesters. And even part of selling batch care is, you know, it's becoming an empty nester as well. Uh, so for me, the, the first line is all about the career and the profession. So pre-kids was all about learning, early corporate days, get as much knowledge as you can, um, suck in as much wisdom as you can from other people. With the phase during the kids, it's all about being in the business. And now as we ent uh, enter the empty nester phase, it's really about working on the business. Likewise, the pre-kids was all about saving. I think those with kids know the phase with kids is all about spending. And now, for us, it's all about enjoying the, the hard work that we put in. Pre-kids, kids, empty nesters, it was all about us at the beginning, and then these little ones came along and it became about them. No matter what you did, it still became them. And now, in this new phase, it's about us again and redefining our life. I think it's nearly impossible to summarize 15 years building a company and exiting a company in one slide. Um, I'd 
say it's been purposeful in its design and ele every element since the beginning in Dang Dog. There was a, a business plan um, from the very beginning in 2004, needed to make sure it was a sizable enough opportunity to be worthwhile. Uh, once that looked good enough, was there a sustainable source of competitive advantage? Believed that was a, a tick as well. So went off on this crazy journey. Um, it was purposeful in its brand DNA and its attitude culture, values, brand, we thought about really carefully and spent money all along the way um, to stay purposeful to the intent. I think it's a tale, a tale of, of purposeful attitude as well, and the resilience and stubbornness and belief of what I was trying to achieve, I never lost sight of. Despite um, five years of not one penny of salary, eight years of no dividends, it was a long, hard slog that many people told me to go back into the corporate world and just to shut it down. Intentional and purposeful about trying to, like children, get batch, for, batch care um, all the way through those terrible uh, early years into a teenager into adulthood. Um, batch care also became a vehicle for self expression, self expression and professional um, stimulation. It gave me amazing flexibility amongst the children as well, and to blend them all together. I think I'm unique in having had the privilege to. to the business, grow the business, scale the business, and exit the business. And even in exiting the business, we were intentional on the thinking of exiting the business and thought about it probably 18 months before we put it into action and thinking about where globally we needed to position ourselves. And I think batch care is almost like restarty, where the reputation and brand is better overseas than it is locally. Uh, we were well known overseas and it made it much easier um, to put it into play. The exit as well was purposeful. It was purposeful in the sense that it was the right thing to do for the company. Uh, it had gone to a certain size that was quite big and being run by a family with a set of decision making that was still uh, at times emotionally driven uh, wasn't the best thing given uh, the potential for the business and we wanted to bring in a shareholder that would make better risk informed decisions and take more risks with the business. Uh, I was quite concerned it was like another another child to me. Um, batch Care was my happy place. For those that, that have seen the branding, find your happy place is what the business was about. And that was a unifying theme, not just for, um, for a brand perspective, but we wanted it to be the happy place for employees. We had, uh, when I left, 60 full-time employees. It's about 100 plus teams of contractors out in the field, and we wanted them to be in their happy place. They got to live in these amazing locations and we live vicariously through them in the city. 2,500 owners, about 175,000 guests uh, that were hosted a year, and we wanted everyone to be in a happy place when they were in, in a bachelor home and having an amazing experience. Um, I think like all uh, happy times, you, know, you need to know when it's time to, to walk away, um, and that happened in December when I stepped down. However, during those 15 years, um, it was uh, the purpose of it was very apparent to me, uh, but it wasn't always apparent from the outside. I love living in chaos. Um, when Stefan saw my slides, he said I should have just taken a picture of my desk. I mean, my desk at home still reflects a, a chaotic way that I work. I thrive in, in the craziness of too much going on at the same time, and I, I thrive on the pressure, and uh, it's just who I am, and maybe it's just the the New York and me can never, uh, can never leave. Um, I think that everyone needs to be clear what it is that defines them. And if you live in chaos and live in the um, less well understood by others, so be it. It's up to you to decide what it is uh, that drives you. Um, finding the balance and being purposeful for me as a, as a mother, it was about family, relationships, and also the business. The people at the office would say I was, the kids and the family were number one. The family would probably say the business was number one. So that's probably, you achieved a balance when both people are uh, in equilibrium. Um, I had flexibility uh, that I could do whatever I wanted with the children as I needed to as, um, as they were growing. It took away from the growth of the business. Batch Care really didn't hit its stride until about five years ago when I was at a point that I had enough headspace and the kids didn't need the constant uh, maternal attention. 
but it was a journey of 15 years to get to those five years to finally hit the hockey curve of 50% annual growth. And each, purpose, each person defines their own balance, their purpose, and their intent on what they need to achieve. You can define your own balance. Uh, once again, this is, uh, this is our, our home, um, up in Glen Bay that we just bought. Uh, for, for me, now is my time. I've given uh, a long time to the kids and to the business. Uh, now is our time. Uh, after 15 years in the business, it's amazing that Seth and I are still married. Um, it's time for, time for us as well. Um, the last nine months have been tough. I think like when your kids leave home, having batch care leave uh, my nest was incredibly difficult. And as I saw our daughter uh, studies in the States, as I saw her off uh, to school uh, in the States, every time the tears would come down my eyes, the tears uh, continued to come down my eyes for quite some time after I sold batch care. Uh, it, was a, it was a third child for me. But it's been really nice having the time for my body and my brain to just relax. It's been time to slow down. It's been time to reflect. Um, I don't say I'm retired, I say I'm on a sabbatical. Um, I feel like I'm just getting started on the on side of things, not the in side of things. And I can't wait for this new phase of our life and what we have planned to. Thank you. So when uh, I started Batch Care, and it came from a need, Seth and I bought a, a beach house in Hahe. We had two young children under two, and to be honest, I didn't want to clean our hub. And it would take us five hours to clean, because as we were cleaning, you had two toddlers just making a mess right behind us. It would take us hours to just get out of the house after being there for two days. Uh, they, we looked really carefully, and I really tried to understand the market, and the source of competitive advantage of Batch Care is the full service management. We have local holiday managers in every area, and that, that was a sustainable source of advantage, and no one can take that away. And as Batch Care grew, the network effect of Batch Care got even stronger. And the more holiday managers we had, the harder it is to replicate. Um, Airbnb, Book of Batch was five years ago, the latest and greatest, and then it became Airbnb. Those for Batch Care are just distribution channels. We can choose where we spend our money. Google, AdWords, Facebook, radio, bus backs, or distribute through Book of Batch or Airbnb. So we never ever saw them as a competitive threat and it just gave us more distribution. The owners that wanted to fully manage would come to us and the owners that wanted to do it themselves were never interested in us and we didn't want them anyway. Um, Batch Care is the only company in Australasia to have direct API connections with Airbnb, Booking.com, Book of Batch um, because we have the uh, we have the scale to do that directly ourselves and we are very intentional on getting big in New Zealand because they gave us, it changed the supplier um, buyer dynamics and they couldn't really dictate to us like they were doing to other countries around the world because we had scale. And part of the reason for putting the company in play was while we had amazing scale in New Zealand and while we had amazing scale regionally, we were tiny globally and we were this little tiny dot at the bottom of the earth and while we had the best intensity of houses per population, um, we were insignificant. And if one of these global you know, billion dollar companies wanted to squash us, it wouldn't be too hard. So by aligning ourselves with another really big company, it just gave us uh, more space to survive and be immune to some of those competitive dynamics. So I started discussions, I went to the board and said this is what's happening and uh, the first time the board said no, we love the company, it's a great earner, you're investing all this money in tech and people and you haven't yet seen the benefit of it, wait. And uh, I went back 
second time and said the same thing, this is what's happening, our window's going to close. We had, uh, with a logical company to uh, consolidate Australia, and if we didn't move, someone from America or Asia would come down, or Europe would come down and consolidate. And after 15 year, years of slogging my guts out and my family kind of having it up to here, I didn't want the company to be valued on a New Zealand uh, multiple, I thought it would be much better um, to be valued at an offshore multiple, which is what happened. So we started having connections of people within the industry, and I made it known that uh, that Magic was a logical one to expand into Australia. And those conversations started having conversations and we went to trade shows. The industry is actually really well organized offshore. Uh, I think it's the whole number eight Kiwi mentality down here. I just did it on, it on our own in isolation, not knowing this whole ecosystem existed, and presented at a couple of conferences to raise our profile. And as we were negotiating with an investment banker to represent us, two offers came in um, from a UK company and an American company, and this, we just carried on with the process. And one of those companies did us. I, I think as businesses, you do have to think about when is the right time to be thinking about exit, because it takes some time to put the pieces in place. It takes time. Like if we knew we were going to sell before, we put a lot of investment, and we were trying to build, and Seth will talk about some of his companies that he's been building. We like working and enduring quality assets, so we probably over-invested if we were just going to sell the company, and we didn't maximize its value because of what we put in, but it was the right thing to do for the company, it was the right thing to do for us in our lifestyle. Great. Thanks, Leslie. Um, there's going to be a round of DNA anyway, so... Anyone would like to uh, pull her aside and ask her any more questions or just have a chat? I'm sure she'll be here for you. Hi, Leslie. Um, yeah, so moving on to uh, question number two. <laughs> oh, number one. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks, Leslie. Um, yeah, so this is Leslie Hayes. I'm the CEO of Seven Chat. Um, I'll just is uh, one of the New Zealand's most accomplished CEOs, um, and he's interested in consumer-oriented businesses operating with a high level of design and leveraging digital technologies. Gradu graduating with a degree in civil engineering, Stefan worked in the heavy construction industry before going on to complete an MBA at Stanford. And that was going to be my question as to whether you both actually met there and you know, resolved that for us. Um, he then worked as a strategic management consultant in San Francisco, um, completing several successful turnaround CEO roles with Whitcalls, Pacific Retail Group, Bendon, as well as active non-executive directors roles in companies including Magic Memories, Carpet Court, and the Sleepyhead Group. Stefan has worked within a range of companies with 150 million to 600 million turnover. In 2011, Stefan co-founded the lingerie company Rosenthorn, where he is now a non-executive director. He firmly believes in designing every aspect of the company around user insights, commercial viability, and future-focused vision. Uh, Stefan has also been on the NZT Beachhead's advisory board for 13 years, and he is the lead designer of its successful Fresh Thinking program. Uh, Beachhead's itself is a global network of experienced growth business leaders assisting his own companies to grow more efficiently and effectively. Now, Meaningful Technology was co-founded by Stefan in 2017. It has evolved by the vision to use data-centric technologies to consolidate data at an enterprise level to enable businesses to significantly reduce their marginal costs and deliver seamless customer experiences. Um, and also, finally but not least, Stefan was a recipient of the 2015 Fuji Xerox AUT Business Leadership Award. Well done. So with that, I'll leave you with Stefan. Thank you. Well, yeah, I'm use the mic, I guess. Thanks, Richard. Um, I've got to tell you, I'm going to start out by telling you this story. Um, I was working, I was one of five executives working with Graham Hart back in the day in the mid-90s, growing his wealth and 
I moved into a chief executive role at Wickles, um, and we had this kind of project in the corner, um, and it was a, um, a internet site. It was kind of like an Amazon for New Zealand. Don't laugh. At the time, it seemed like a good idea, okay? And um, they weren't that interested in it. You know, Graham's very really kind of um, transactional about business, kind of like his sales up, cost down, or in the margin kind of thinking. And um, uh, I thought, oh, why don't we just buy that off them and then we'll set it up into some kind of business. And uh, so I rocked up uh, to Stephen James, who was one of the other of the five employees there. And I said, who's a good accountant in town? Like a hungry dog, and he, and he sent me off to Gilligan Shepherd and to see Bruce Shepherd. And I met him in, I believe, your bicycle uh, outfit after you strenuously ridden uh, to work. And um, you know, I thought, man, that guy is definitely unemployable, right? <laughs> and, you know, it really resonated with me because either he's running this whole company and uh, by the way I've since talked to his independent chair and she's confirmed that he's unemployable uh, so that <laughs> although today he's wearing a suit so I don't know if that was you but it's the first time in 25 years I've seen him wear a suit so <laughs> yeah, oh, were you? Were you? Um, anyway uh, it was an inspiration to me actually because what that represents is that you don't actually need to fit yourself into a box to be expressive and, and productive in the world. That you can be a person who is fully self-expressed in, in an environment. And so today I'll talk you through a little bit about the evolution of how um, I feel I've been able to be self-expressed and free in business while doing what I'm really interested in doing and making a decent amount of money and living a good life. So thank you for that, uh, Bruce. I think this is how most people think about it. Purpose. You know, they they know that they want to achieve a higher value state, and whether the con whether that's in a context of being a personal context or in a business context, it doesn't really matter. Right? The thing is, we want we all seek a higher value state, and we want to seek that state over time. And so, I have now you know got a reasonable amount of experience about business overall and people overall. I would say that the way people think about that is incremental. So they have a lot of knowledge about where they're at, and then they want to add stuff to it. So if you think about my life early on, I knew I was pretty smart. I grew up with parents. My mum's 19 years old, and um, you know, I, I I just knew that if I was going to be a success, I have to work hard. So I just work hard. It means get good grades, and you know, it means try this out, try that out. But there's no direction to it. And the difficulty with lacking direction is that you have a lot more kind of luck involved and, and nothing has a synergy, right? And I, I'm not going to complain about this because this random kind of approach to growth uh, saw me do some really cool things, you know, like I accidentally went to Stanford Business School simply because I said, oh, this business thing is good. I didn't even know about business until I was 30. And I just happened to be working for a company or someone who happened to have gone to business school. And they said, business school, you should go to business school. And I'm like, I don't even know what business is. And, uh, and um, so, you know, and, they, and then I said, all right, all right. And then they said, oh, well, you might as well apply to the best schools. And I'm like, oh, there are best schools. And, and so I said, oh, you know, I'm completely innocent. I went to Stanford and who knows how it would go. And like, seriously, I interview students to get in there now. And I'm like, holy shit, how did I get in? Um, so, uh, when I got there, I, I thought I was the dumbest person in the whole place, right? But luckily, after you know, after time has revealed that the Americans are on average pretty dumb, so <laughs> 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 Trump, right? I mean, what the hell? Um, yeah. <laughs> but you know, accidental stuff that's good happens, and, and one of the things I was met Leslie there. And I've got to say, that was, she would be one of the highest MPV wives of anyone I know. I think the Halls are in here too, and Peter Hall would agree, he's got a high MPV wife. 
but it's a different legal way to go, right? Because I know some guys and their wives are negative MPB to the max. <laughs> <laughs> the personal name terms at Gucci, right? <laughs> and then I started to think, like, you know, I, I, I went to a course, um, which I won't talk a lot about, it was just one of these, some people call it a cult thing. Um, but, but, you know, this not everything is negative about anything. Was this exercise you sort of lie on your deathbed and sort of look back at your life and say, what, what are your regrets? And because I got brought up by 19, 20 year old parents and we had no money, like literally, even my dad left with a secretary, and my mother used to say, I'm not sure if we can eat this weekend. You know, I, I remember vowing at 11, I'm never going to inflict that on my kids, right? And what that does is that drives you to do things, and that can be productive or unproductive. For me, it was reasonably productive, thank God. Um, but what it was is that security, financial security was far more important than you know, going and taking risks. And I knew when that proposition was put before me, I knew that would be a trap. And so I found this saying somehow, and it's far better to dare money things to win glorious times, even though checked by failure, than to live in the grey twilight that knows not the victory and defeat. So what that's saying is you, it's one stage, one life. If you don't live the life you want, then you waste it. And so it caused me to do some pretty crazy things. And this is the first one. And so this business was found, this is what caused me to go and see Bruce, you see. This business was called Flying Pig. Why is it called Flying Pig? Because we needed to get brand awareness really quickly and one of our friends, was the number three person in Yahoo. And I rang her up and talked to me. She said, you just got to name something crazy because you never remember, right? And I did this with a business partner, a guy that I worked at Bain in San Francisco with, who was a Harvard engineer. And he wanted to come in New Zealand and hang out. And, and so I said, oh, let's, you know, we said, oh, let's do this together. So we bought the workforce assets. And, um, and then we turned it into flyingpig.co.nz. And uh, we actually got 40... Um, Forty percent unprompted awareness, like in two months, it was amazing. It was all like all over the newspaper. Someone even offered us forty million dollars value to merge it into some Australian e-commerce thing. Crazy, stupid stuff. Right? This is the first internet. But I know. But, but, and we we said if we call it flying pig, what happens? And this is the great thing about failure. What happens if it fails? And I just imagine, you know, there'd be a pig crashing and there'd be a newspaper headline that says the pig crashes, right? Now, that happened. It actually happened. And this is the artifact that Adam and I produced afterwards, which is a $99,999 business education with a check for $1, which is what we got from our seed capital. And the 20 lessons of what we're never going to do again. <laughs> and I swear some of those lessons were very valuable for Leslie later on, because she could learn vicariously from it. Um, but, you know, you always think failure is bad, right? But failure changed my life nothing. It didn't change it at all. And one of the things, I even got the seed capital back, because I did a tax deal and managed to flip the back some of the, a whole lot of losses from everyone else. The thing is, is that you can parlay failure into all sorts of things, right? And um, the three lessons have stuck with me, and I think uh, it, it made me comfortable about the adventure formation, it made me comfortable about taking risks. It, it just kind of put that whole security hang up aside. And one other thing I'll say is that after about five months of founding this, I was on the board of a sort of retail and they begged me to come in and be the CEO. And I said, oh, I can't, I've got to start. And they said, oh, it's okay, you can do it half time. And I'm like, how can you be a, 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 a CEO of a public company half time? And amazingly, uh, the, the guy that had the majority stake is in jail now. So, <laughs> <laughs> but amazingly, we got a six times exit on that. And you know, it taught me another thing about Fredo's law, right? 20% of what you do is 50% so 
if, if, if you want to talk about that graph that Leslie had up there and focus and all that sort of thing, you know, it sort of taught me like, to be light hands on, cause it, cause that thing to happen, don't do it. Because when you're half time running a five hundred million dollar company, you can't do it. So I think a far more effective way to look at uh, the growth of anything or your investment of anything, whether your time or personally or whatever, is to just you've got to envision the future state you want to get to. And I have found that it's it's amazingly easy to visualize the future state with quite a lot of clarity. And there's a saying from Wayne Gretzky, who's the greatest high safety player in the world, and said, and someone asked him why is it why is he the best high safety hockey player in the world? And he said, other players skate to the puck, I skate to where the puck's gonna be. And we live in a technology revolution, right? And it affects every single business. And what is happening is that you have been gifted the opportunity of being able to grow amazingly productive assets, whether you've got an existing legacy asset right now, a new asset or whatever. It's just this amazing thing because you can imagine the business that needs to exist in the conditions that are going to exist in five years. And you can put the parts together very, very cheaply now um, because the bigger companies just can't get their heads around the change. And the other great thing about envisioning the future is that you can build a staircase up to it with relative clarity. Right? So in the um, work I do with NZT, I've probably been involved in about 250 New Zealand growth companies. The bigger, one of the biggest mistakes is just a lack of visioning what they're trying to do, and then inability to deliver themselves a to-do list of prioritized and important projects. What they're all doing is they're working on what they think is urgent, and all they're doing is putting the wheel harder and harder and not growing. So you, when, to imagine the future of clarity, you need to have look at things with lenses, right? Because obviously, overwhelmingly complex. So you need to look at it through different lenses and learn from each lens. One of those lenses could be just your own life goal. Another lens could be the goal for the business, the environmental context and technological context that you're in. It could be just having life meaning. And one of the things you've got to ask as well is, is it bold enough? Because if it's not bold, it's just not worth your time, right? And speaking of bold, uh, Richard talked about meaningful, and meaningful is like a stupid project. Let me tell you, it's a 50-50. But every, bus every board I've been on and every uh, company I've been involved with, one of the most defining issues is how do we get all these applications working together how do we get intelligence out of all of these applications that we run? And so I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but this is a really far-seeing uh, vision for how you can literally drag and drop applications together and create a brain for your company with where you can know anything in real time about what your company is doing, your customers, your employees, whatever, um, because it's just sucking data from every system, every application and organizing it for you, storing it for you, and then enabling you to ship it to any other application. So this is probably one of the most profound insights I've had over the last 25 years. And this came from work I did as director of Better by Design, which is the New Zealand government's initiative around bringing higher design values and innovation values to New Zealand business. And so we all think, particularly if you've been to business school, you all think through siloed lenses about how you make decisions in business. This is how a designer thinks about designing something. A pair of shoes, a pair of, you know, a, a, a customer experience. And what I'm saying is that you can use this to think about the growth of a business. And so what intention is, is like that thing in the future that you're trying to aim for. Notice I don't call it purpose, right? It's only purpose when you validate it and you've got a team alignment behind getting it. So the three things to consider in a perfect design are desirability, so it has to be anything you make has to be desirable for the people that use it, right? Viability, the resources that go into it have to be way less than the value of the outcome that comes out. And feasibility is that you technically have to do, be able to do it, right? So it's a very, very simple model. If 
you take those and think of them as lenses or spinning plates, you need, if you create a business, you need to spin all those plates in harmony. And so they break down underneath into things like in desirability, look at the accessibility and scale of markets, the, uh, a great design, we haven't got time to talk about design, we'll do hours on that, but a great design changes the behavior of the people that use it, right? That's the critical measure. And so if your business doesn't change the behavior of the people that use it, you're not adding enough value. And um, the viability is about the efficiency of the business model for growth, so the lowest possible marginal cost of growth, how you defend it, because as soon as you do something good, everyone's gonna copy it, right? And where it sits on the value chain, and what you can see in the value chain right now is that products that build strategic power around product are declining in strategic power, and businesses that build um, their strategies around delivering solutions directly using technology are gaining in power. So obviously, build your strategy where you can Cheap. And lastly, feasibility is about governance, building great networks of people who know what you don't know, uh, getting the right talent, having leading edge technology, etc. etc. Just a little bit on risk, because um, I'm getting to the end here in my time. Um, you know, because security was a big theme for me when I was younger, um, I guess I look at it like this, right? There's a difference between gambling and risk. And the thing about a risk, what you want to do is you want to fail as cheaply as possible and you want to try as many things as you can. And so if you fail cheaply, and then obviously you don't carry on with that because that didn't work. But you've tried a lot of things and some things work, you can double up on things that work. If you did that calculation there with using a Monte Carlo analysis or something, it will show you that, that you are absolutely, success is absolutely inevitable even in highly risky environments, as long as you can fail cheaply and you try a lot of stuff. Um, and then lastly, a little comment on balance. Um, I think, you know, most people who are successful and include us in this, is we're not balanced by the measure of work and play. And our house kind of feels like, for the last 20 years, kind of feels like a, um, an office environment, to be honest. And I'm, I'm not saying there's not lots of love there and it's all great, and, you know, but the, the reality is is that we're all talking about business. Um, both parents are business people. And our kids, amazingly, um, Zach is uh, 21 now, he's an engineering, um, finishing his third year of engineering. But he got invited by his university to head up the business of, of this, they do this thing where they build race cars and race them and they build a business model around it. He's the one who has to go and present the business. And because he's actually got this thing, just from listening to us from when he was seven years old, I remember him coming to us when he's seven, he said, I think he was talking to you, Leslie, about magic, and he said, I think the problem with magic is you're not doing enough marketing. And it was seven. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if anyone says it's not an advantage to have parents in a certain space versus another, I and mean, these kids are mega advantage in that regard. Um, but I do think that balance is really about these things. You know, you have to have an emotional life. You have to have some spirituality. For us, that's a lot about the outdoors, engaging with the sea and the mountains, and we do that. And um, you have to be intellectually curious and rejuvenate yourself. And just riffing on that for a minute, your life's gonna, in retrospect, I think will feel very short if you do the same thing all the time. So we've tended, as Leslie pointed out, to blow life up in a pretty sort of ceremonial kind of way. And the last set of ceremony, apart from selling badge deals, we sold our house in Parnell, we live in an apartment now, and, um, and then we have this toy here. This is a, um, a one of 18 global expedition uh, motor yachts it's capable of going from here to Los Angeles in one tank. And um, we plan to cruise this around the world from May 22 for three years full time. Um, so we're hoping COVID dies away. And, um, and that's really it. Thanks for listening. And uh, questions for you.
again, uh, step out and we'll be around afterwards. And thanks very much. Very insightful, and uh, I can certainly imagine the stories around your dinner table. <laughs> Probably quite different to stories around mine, but um, good things to come, I'm sure. Um, and particularly once Species had a bit of a rest and a, a recharge and uh, gets going again. Um, I also know why Bruce wore a suit today, because he wasn't intending to. He, as soon as he found out he wasn't speaking, he thought he'd come along with his, in his bike gear by riding down here, but he had to jump in the car, I see. Um, so our third speaker, last but not least, I'm sure she's been waiting with bated breath all, all evening to get started, uh, is our lovely Joshna. Now, uh, Joshna, uh, for those that don't know, uh, tomorrow actually, is her eight, eighth year anniversary with us at GS. So uh, well done, making it that far. It's uh, Bruce and myself. Um, I was going to go off script, but I thought I'd better stay on script because there's a few things I could say and I might not go back down to the colony. But, um, um, one thing, of course, is uh, with COVID, um, had a bit of an emergency meeting um, before around uh, late April, early May. Um, Gosh, I came along and uh, Killing and Shepherd, I, I guess we sort of like doing things a bit different to everyone else, and uh, we came out of that meeting deciding, well, let's just appoint a new partner. Let's just show that, uh, you know, there is life after COVID. We want to show the positivity of everything that's going on and uh, that things will um, come right. Um, it's just a matter of time. So, um, so well done in that regard, too, joining the club. Um, so, Josh now has over 15 years' experience uh, as a chartered accountant. Um, and she leads our value added services team, um, specialising in transactions, strategies, and forensics. Josh's specific skills and passion are in business and share valuations. She's our valuer within the firm. And she also provides litigation support, including forensic analysis. Um, natural litigation culture always involves time pressure by having to remain at peak mental performance. With her advanced analytical and financial modelling skills, she is also a passionate uh, strategic, uh, strategist, sorry, uh, providing support for businesses with strategic and operational review work as part of the wider team. Tasks with leading and working within the value added services team requires constant management of time, which includes both that of her team, that of her clients, which sometimes includes managing expectations, and of course her own time, working both in and on the business, and not to forget duties at home, of course. Um, as important to Joshna as all of the above is growing and supporting talent, and contributing to the success of the whole, her personal and professional growth, and quality time with her family and friends. So Joshna, the floor is yours. Starting again. Thank you, Richard, for that introduction. Um, I can't really ever forget the day I started at GS. Every year I'm reminded of it because there's fireworks that night, skyhawks. <laughs> um, I'd just like to start by firstly um, acknowledging our first two speakers of the evening. Experience is such a great teacher and the collective experience you both bring and what you have achieved, what you've done and what you continue to do is invaluable to learn from. And I'm sure every one of us have taken something away tonight from that. And also just thank you so much for being so real and personal about it. It's really refreshing. So thank you, thank you very much. So I wanna talk about purposeful time today and what it means to me. I see purposeful time as effective use of time to further our purpose or our purposes in all the different aspects of our lives. 
I know in the past, I often found myself at work, you know, tr working, trying to get work done, and all I'm thinking about is my family and home life and thinking, oh, I wish I'd done that better, I need to do that better, I need to spend more time basically guilt tripping myself, right, while I'm at work. And then when I'm with my family at home, I'm thinking, oh, I haven't done this at work, I need to do this, I need to address this. So, you know, when we're not fully present um, with what we are doing now, how can we be acting purposefully and getting the most out of it? And how do we manage all these different aspects of our lives that we value to give the best we can and to get the best out of it? So I'll just start with a disclaimer and disclosure. What follows is my take on purposeful time. Management of time, which plays quite importantly into purposeful time, um, is really a discipline. Um, and different things work for different people. I am by no means an expert, and I am really also just learning by trying things that I've read or otherwise learned. What I talk about today is what works for me, and where I can, I will talk about the process I went through to find what works. So breaking it up, let's start with purpose. How do we derive our purpose in life? And is there just one purpose that overarches and you know, fits every aspect of our life? Or do we need to have multiple purposes for all the different areas of our lives that we consider important? I think in most cases in adult lives, there's probably three areas that are focused on. Being um, work, business or career, um, family and friends, and self, not necessarily in that order. So I think the first step to building purpose or your purposes is actually consciously sitting down and working out what your priorities are and actually ordering them in order of importance. Once you've done that, a useful exercise is to actually just sit on them, sit on what you've identified as your priorities for, I'd say, a minimum of two weeks um, up to a month. And during that time, at the end of every day, just write down where you spent your time. And be honest about it. So if you're at home, helping children with your home, their homework, but actually what you're doing is checking your emails, replying to emails, or doing work in your head. Um, do allocate that time to work. At the end of that period that you've chosen, sit down and go through where you've actually spent your time. Does it actually align with your identified priorities? It doesn't necessarily mean that you should allocate the most amount of time to your highest priority, but you should basically have an idea of how much time you should be spending on each of those. Um, example being, you might have decided that one of your priorities is spending more time with your children or quality time with your children. And over your two weeks or a month, you spend 10 hours a week with your kids. But you've also spent 20 hours on Netflix and social media which factors nowhere within your priorities. So there's obviously something wrong there, right? So if your time that you spend and your priorities are not in alignment, you're gonna actually have to rethink. Rethink either where your priorities actually are or how you allocate your time. Work can be a bit of a skewing factor here because obviously we need to be at work for a certain amount of hours a day or be present in our businesses for a certain time a day. So this is all the more reason to actually try and be more productive during work allocated time so it doesn't creep into other areas. We'll look at some strategies for this um, a bit later. So when you have your priorities, the next step is identifying your purpose within each of those. You may then be able to develop an overarching purpose that covers all this. 
The important thing is there's no use going through this exercise and setting your purpose and continuing as you were, hoping that something will magically change. You must really try and be aware of your purpose or purposes as much as possible. Um, this may mean reminding yourself every morning, having it stuck somewhere that you can see it um, quite prominently, or somewhere that you can access it really easily. And initially you may also want to remind yourself during the day of your purpose as you switch between your identified priorities. So, so far, we have identified our priorities, observed how our time plays within these priorities. Currently, this exercise may have highlighted some changes which need to be made in how we allocate our time. We've set our purpose for each priority, so now we move on to managing our time so that it's more aligned with our priorities and purpose. This brings us to time. Time is one of the constants in life and it runs through every single thing we do. For me personally, what really transformed how I think about time was really simple. Every second we are living, we are also basically closer to dying. So you can look at every second as being closer to dying, or you can commit to living every second. And what this really means is that you need to work with time instead of continuously trying to work against it. And if you commit to living every second, it takes us back to identifying our priorities and living with purpose. So I think Richard talked about this. Time is finite, right? You have 24 hours in a day and nobody can change that. So we can't suddenly obtain more time, can we? I say, yes, we can. So depending on your sleeping habits, if you decide to wake up two hours earlier, you've suddenly got more time. If you have more energy, you've suddenly got more usable time. If you avoid distraction, you have more usable time. And if you practice self-care instead of self-indulgence, it means that you see time as an asset rather than wasting it as a, as a distraction. So example here, because this is a really important distinction. Say you come to the end of a hectic work week. You're in the middle of this big project and it's really challenging and you've come across this problem that you just simply cannot overcome. But hey, yay, it's Friday. You know, you deserve it. You're going to stop work at four. You're going to have more than a few drinks. You've got a party on Saturday night. You, so you drink a lot on Friday. You sleep all day Saturday. Party all night Saturday night. And all of Sunday you spend um, binge eating, binge Netflix. And so this ends up at 2 a.m. in the morning on Monday. You do have to go back to work on Monday morning. I've been there like a few years ago, I've, I've been there. <laughs> um, and you're left with that same problem and less time and less energy to deal with it. Probably better approach to that weekend might have been to do something that left you more energetic and motivated so that you could come back to work on Monday and actually um, think about the problem in a different way. Maybe you could have um, read your favourite book, gone for a really long walk, um, listened to an inspiring podcast. You could even have spent just an hour or two over wine, researching or looking at your problem in a different way, or a different setting at least. And have a drink and watch a movie or something, but it may not be the best um, weekend for a depleted energy and too little sleep. So revisiting waking up earlier. And our sleep is very important, obviously. So waking earlier does not mean sacrificing sleep. Waking up earlier probably means going to bed earlier. 
And for those of us who are not used to it, both of these are really hard. But take it from me, it really just takes some time before it becomes a habit. And what forces the habit is how waking up earlier and the effect it has makes you feel. Most of us set our alarms um, for the morning so that we have just enough time to do what we need to do in the morning. So, you know, getting ready, getting your kids ready, getting making lunches, drop-offs, which means that just enough time ends up that you run late and it becomes really stressful. One of the key tips I had from my favorite podcaster, Jay Shetty, is just wake up an hour or two earlier than you need to. This takes a bit of practice, but for me, what it's meant for my mornings is that I have time to myself. I can sit there and I can journal with a cup of coffee. I can actively think about my purposes and how I'm living them. I find time for exercise and meditation. Um, I can do everything I need to do without rushing and without stress. And the best, one of the best things is just having the house tidy for when everyone comes back from home, uh, back home after that day. And the mornings are just so peaceful. And that feeling sets you up for the whole day and your day ends up being much more productive. Another useful tip is to Prepare for the morning after the evening before. So prepare for the next morning, the evening before. Know the clothes you're gonna wear, the lunches you will prepare, any special requirements for the day, and also write down what the three main things you wanna be achieving that day are. Our brains actually have limited decision-making capability every day. So we take that decision-making energy and the stress away from the morning, so we can use it more productively. Know your when. Basically this is um, finding when the best time for you is during the day to focus on different things. When are you, based on your body clock, most productive and focused? And what tasks should you allocate to these times of the day? Um, some of us know this for ourselves, but there are books where you can actually explore this. Um, one of them is When by Daniel Pink, which um, I've read and it's been really helpful. So when you are aware of the best times to do things for you, maintaining discipline in this is very important. Part of it is managing expectations of others around you. Um, but a good tool to use is just use your calendar, block out time, and turn off um, notifications like emails for focus time. We all also have a lot of non-productive time, or yeah, non-productive time during our days. This may be commutes to work, getting ready, doing housework. Now, there's so many people I come across and they complain about not having enough time to read or self-development or, you know, something. The, we're so lucky now we've got audio books and we've got media that we carry around with us. So these are our really good times to just catch up on that stuff or even just, you know, listen to music or something to relax your mind. We all have come across CVs and everything, and there's much made of um, multitasking. The current trend, of, from, based on what I'm reading at the moment, is um, single tasking. So single tasking is really just focusing on one thing for an allocated amount of time. Yes, generally, in work and life, we need to be able to manage many different deliverables at the same time. But if multitasking means you should be able to do more than one thing at the same time really well, um, it may be flawed when it comes to assessing efficiency. Being on and being off. This is one of the main things I'm working on at the moment. I'm sure there are many of us here who are always on. We're always checking and replying to emails at any time that we're awake and choose to look at our phones. 
We're working past clothes in our heads, on our phones or on, even on our laptops. For me, COVID here was a real eye-opener. During this time, it became really prob problematic as there really, for some reason, there just seemed to be no boundaries. And this is the first time in my life when my family started complaining. A few weeks later, I had a conversation with a colleague on a book he was reading. This proposed that extended times of being on or being on all the time actually meant you were probably operating at a level of six or seven out of 10. But to be able to operate at a 10, you actually need to go down to a zero during your downtime. Note here that the movement up the scale to 10 is actually exponential, not linear. Turning off and down to zero is really hard to do. But the positives I'm seeing so far is that I am trying to not think about work or do work when I have allocated time for my son or my family. And it is having a very immediate positive effect. Um, and, hope, and I don't think any detrimental effects at work. To be able to do all of these things, um, especially the on and off, you need to be meet managing expectations. We all know about managing external expectations, right? We always talk about managing expectations of our colleagues, our friends, our family, yeah, our clients. Um, but what I find it the hardest expectation to manage is the expectation we put on ourselves. I mean, how many days um, have you not finished what you plan to do that day, but for some reason you think that you're going to finish what you left out today and do everything you're meant to do tomorrow, tomorrow. There are so many times we failed at doing things that might be ten, over 10 years or 10 times we failed at doing something, but for some reason we think the next time we try we are definitely going to succeed. So managing expectations is important, but I think also added manage your own expectations. So summarizing. Sit down and consciously articulate your priorities in life. Understand where your time is currently going. Understand where your time should be going and plan accordingly. Have purpose for each priority in your life and assess yourself regularly on your purpose alignment and obtain more time when you can. Better use and using time as an asset, not a distraction. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Jocelyn. Um, certainly the whole buy time thing resonates with me. Because uh, as most of the team know, um, I usually get up at 4, 4.30 in the morning to uh, get on my bike, get my exercise before work. Family is not up, so I'm not involved with them. Get to the office by 5.30. Um, no one turns up till 7.30, so I've got normally two hours to myself, no interruptions, leave the lights off, safe power. Um, <laughs> but I pick it because of, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. But I pick it because a few years ago when I went back, um, you know, I just watched TV from 6.30 to 11 or something. And yet I was feeling stressful because I wasn't getting the exercise done, I was feeling tired the next day because I'd gone to bed late this sort of thing. So thanks for the exercise. I mean, it uh, resonates with me. So. Any uh, questions from the floor for Joshua? Yeah, all right. Joshua's going to be around. Um, so that's it in terms of the, uh, the presentation side of things. Um, you know, all the you like me to change the slide, is that what this means? Yes. <laughs> oh, and some credits. Yeah. Uh, so clearly, a thank you to our three speakers, um, Leslie, Stefan, and, and Joshna. Um, now, the, the, um, no need to rush off. Uh, the bar's going to be open until uh, 7.30. Um, so an opportunity for you to, to mingle together and have something else to eat, uh, eat and drink. Um, there's a number of the Nicola and Shepherd team here. Uh, 
most of them, I think, and they've got the little blue tags on. So perhaps it's an opportunity to, to meet your accountant if you haven't had the opportunity to meet them before, or just sneak in the, those odd questions thinking it's off the clock. So, you know, you're not going to get charged for it. So that's what I do. <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks for listening and, and, uh, and, and coming along. It's been great to actually have a, a physical face-to-face -face, um, gathering finally. So, and thanks very much to Lisa for uh, obviously, yes, you're in the spotlight now for doing all the organisation and, and it's been a, a very trying time for her, I know, with the bookings. Uh, obviously, thanks to the people of the, the, um, the, um, the Yacht Squadron as well because they were very supportive when obviously COVID hit and we need to change dates. They just supported us all the way through. So, thanks very much for coming.